Hi, everyone. Welcome to the TLC Foundation for VFRB's webinar series. Um, today's topic is the application of the COMB model, that's the comprehensive behavioral model, to the treatment of skin picking. And our speaker today is Dr. Fred Penzel, who is a pioneer in the field of treating VFRBs. Fred has uh, been a member of TLC's scientific advisory board since our very start and uh, speaks at our conferences and our retreats more than I can number and is an incredibly popular speaker um, and, a, um, and a very busy clinician who has uh, seen, seen many, many hundreds of patients with these disorders. Uh, and so he is going to be sharing uh, his, his clinical expertise with us today, um, specifically on the topic of treating uh, skin picking. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is now a, a free series, our webinars, um, and we're, we're thrilled to be able to bring this, uh, this information to your living room or your office. Um, I'm Jennifer Rakes. I'm the executive director of TLC, and um, I will be here uh, listening in and helping field your questions uh, for Fred at the end of the presentation. So Fred will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we will have time for questions. We can't see or hear you, unfortunately, so the way that you, our audience, can ask your questions is to type them in. There should be a control panel on your screen, and towards the bottom of, of it is a tab that says questions. And that is where you can type in your questions, and I will see them, and then I will field them to Fred when he's ready for questions at the end. We will wait until the end for questions unless there's something urgent that seems to be coming up or something that seems to be very confusing and, and needs to get clarified uh, earlier. Um, but usually that doesn't happen. Um, and if you do have any, um, yeah, so, it's, so feel free to ask your questions at any time that they come to your mind. You can type them in when they occur to you, and then I will, um, I will ask them a Fred at, at the end. Um, and I just thank you, and if this, uh, if this program, this webinar winds up being helpful to you, I hope that you will consider visiting TLC's website, bfrb.org, and um, perhaps choosing to support our organization, uh, because it is uh, donors like you that uh, make all of these programs possible. Thank you, and thank you, Fred. I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Okay. Am I on? You're on. Okay, my pleasure. Okay, so let's get going because we have a lot of material to cover. So uh, obviously we know the title of this and today's date, so let's go to the first slide. Uh, which are the goals for today, okay? So I want to do three things here. I would like to present a model of compulsive skin picking, uh, CSP as you'll see it, uh, abbreviated or excoriation disorder as it's also called. I want to explain the comb model or the comprehensive behavioral model of analyzing an individual's skin picking. And thirdly, I want to demonstrate how this model can be applied to treatment of skin picking via what we call the SCAMP model. And I'll explain all of this as we go along, so it'll be very clear, I believe. Okay, well, first of all, basically, there is no one-size-fits-all when it comes to the treatment of BFRBs. A good treatment program must be tailored to fit each individual. So. There's no one simple little approach or simple trick or uh, tip that will suddenly you know, bring everything under control. Everybody is different. Everybody brings different things to the situation. Uh, so let me, let me first talk about a, a model that I follow and I know that people also follow, uh, which is the stimulus regulation model of BFRBs. And it, it says that behaviors such as hair pulling, skin picking, nail biting, et cetera, may be an external attempt on the part of, a genetically, of genetically prone individuals to regulate or balance an internal state of stimulatory imbalance. You have to sort of think of your nervous system as uh, almost like this picture of somebody on a tightrope that leaning in either direction, uh, and I'll show you a diagram that'll clear this up, to, to stay balanced, in other words. So the model says this, you know, that uh, states of understimulation or overstimulation uh, can result and, and that the body uh, focused repetitive behavior, uh, if you look on the left hand side, it either provides stimulation to relieve boredom or inactivity and if you look on the other side, uh, the BFRB reduces stimulation or overstimulation to relieve stress or even excitement. 
because uh, even happy kinds of excitement can uh, stimulate these behaviors. So, so the behaviors are really aimed at keeping a person balanced. It's a way of regulating yourself because whatever internal mechanism may regulate this for a person, uh, I believe, is not working so well. So it, the, the person tries to help it externally. Uh, hence, we have picking, pulling, biting, etc. So, okay, so using the comb model, let me tell you a little bit about that uh, of BFRB treatment. This is a model that's used for understanding individual cases of BFRBs and for choosing the most effective strategies for each particular person. It studies each of the inputs that have a potential role to play in each individual's pulling, picking, or biting. And to give credit where it's due, this was in, it was originated by Dr. Charles Mansueto, a licensed psychologist uh, who's head of the Behavior Therapy Center of Greater Washington in Silver Spring, Maryland, a good friend of mine and an expert clinician, uh, and also someone who's been in this field since the very beginning. So uh, further about the co-model, although skin picking may appear similar across individuals as a group, in other words, it looks sim superficially the same between people, there's actually a great deal of variability from person to person in how the behavior is carried out and also in terms of the factors, or that is the many triggers and inputs that influence each individual's picking behaviors. And this requires a detailed functional analysis of the individual's behavior. So we want to learn as much about all of the things that go into making each person's disorder uh, look and, and act the way it does. Uh, now the analysis itself that I'm talking about here is, is done according to a, a second model, which is called the SCAMP model. Uh, Charles Mansueto came up with this, uh, I don't know exactly why, but he calls it the SCAMP model, and it's a good, it's a good name, it's easy to remember. Okay, so what is it? Uh, it's used to help analyze information about an individual's particular patterns of picking. It helps identify, categorize, and organize all the various triggers and inputs that make up an individual's picking. And these are the components of the SCAMP model, and you can see why it's called that, because of the the, uh, the first letter of each word uh, spells out SCAMP, obviously. Uh, S is sensory, or sense experiences. Uh, then there's the cognitive, or, or beliefs, or ideas that people have that, that feed into it. Affective inputs, which means your emotions. Motoric, which is uh, refers to physical actions. And place, which is environment, or the, the environment in which the behavior uh, takes place and has become connected with. This actually gives you a little better idea of how we try to get information from people. This is one type of self-monitoring form that we sometimes give people to uh, write down information and bring into uh, sessions, uh, indicating uh, you know the strengths of the urges, uh, feelings that that come before pulling, picking, or biting, uh, thoughts, uh, efforts to resist, interventions that have used. Uh, if a person stopped, uh, why did they stop? Uh, thoughts and feelings, you know, the consequences, uh, how much visible damage there was, uh, what what the person did after the picking episode ended, and any other comments or observations. So we try to, since we can't follow each individual around, we get them to self-monitor and bring in this information. And this, together with what they tell us in therapy sessions, goes into putting together sort of a profile of each person. So let's, let's go through the SCAMP model and we'll show you how it can be applied in each case to treating someone, you know, based on the information we get. So first let's look at sensory. Okay, now in, in the sen when we're looking at sensory triggers or inputs, we're looking to either stimulate where a person's understimulated or soothe uh, through tactile, visual, or oral means. And some sensory intervention strategies would include uh, stimulation substitution, in other words, harmless kinds of stimulation that are non-destructive but will provide stimulation to an understimulated nervous system. Uh, stimulation reduction, which means soothing uh, a, an overstimulated nervous system. Again, we're doing these things externally, but now we're doing them in, in non-destructive ways. Distraction, which can also be a help in some cases and also over-the-counter remedies. So let me go through these one by one. Uh, sensory substitution. These are just some suggestions of things that have worked. Obviously, this is not all-inclusive. Uh, there's many, many other things besides what's on here, but it, it can include uh, brushing your hair or massaging your scalp if you pick your scalp, uh, brushing or massaging a pet, 
picking uh, bits of skin off a piece of a fruit or a vegetable. Playing with TheraPutty. We like TheraPutty a lot. You can buy it on Amazon. It usually comes in different strengths. It's used for hand therapy. Uh, it comes in different colors, and each color is a different strength. Uh, squeeze stress balls or foam balls. Uh, in fact, I just came across a, a stress ball today that talks. I saw it on Amazon.com. It says calm down, among other things. It's really kind of funny. One of my patients just told me about these. Uh, use brushes or other items to provide tactile stimulation to the hands, you know, the fingertips uh, particularly. Uh, get a textured steering wheel cover for your car if you, you know, pick in the car. Uh, playing with small toys that are textured, uh, you know, things that can be manipulated, uh, textured objects, just about anything you can find from pot scrubbers to uh, Velcro to uh, koosh balls, you name it. Uh, popping bubble wrap has been very popular. Now we have electronic bubble wrap, which you can also find on Amazon.com. It's a little uh, square with little buttons that you push on it to make the sounds of popping bubble wrap, if you like that. Uh, ha handling a furry or velvety stuffed animal. Again, these are all things that have different effects on, on your nerve endings. Uh, manipulate tooth lock washers. This is something I discovered a long time ago. It's a kind of lock washer that looks like a little star. that's got points all the way around the edges. We put them together and we make bunches of them. They're very stimulating for the hands. Uh, miniature slinky toys have been popular. And then other things that you commonly just find lying around, like rubber bands, paper clips, or string. Uh, here's even more things. I, c I could go on and on. The list is endless, really. But these are just, again, further examples of things that you can use uh, to substitute, uh, substitute ways of getting stimulation. Uh, stimulation reduction. Uh, again, these are things that are soothing. Uh, meditation, stretching, or practicing yoga. Uh, all excellent. I send uh, quite a few of uh, my patients who have problems with uh, stress or need stress reduction to yoga because I, I particularly like it because it gives uh, breathing, uh, it helps you stretch tension out of your body, and it teaches meditation. And uh, again, you know, relaxation and breathing exercises are something you can do. Uh, topical anesthetic can, can reduce stimulation to particular areas. Uh, an exercise routine, warm baths. Uh, cold packs, the areas that itch, burn, or tingle. Massages, although, you know, I guess there's limits to how much you can do those. Uh, listening to a favorite calming piece of music. Uh, relaxing or engrossing hobbies that, that are very, uh, uh, you know, all-encompassing, that, that really make time sort of fly and that uh, really take your full attention up. Uh, give yourself a manicure or a pedicure, again, with precautions because we don't want these things to get out of hand. Taking a nap even if you just feel tired or you're feeling uh, uh, stressed out and jangled, uh, taking a nap can be a big help. Okay, distraction, another uh, strategy. Uh, playing an engaging video game that gets you to use both your hands. Uh, interesting hobbies. Again, anything that's really engrossing can be a distraction. Some of these things, as you'll see, overlap between categories because they fall into more than one group. Uh, watching a video, again, with some precautions, some people if you watch a very stimulating or exciting video, that can lead to uh, picking, for instance. Uh, go for a walk or go jogging. Uh, exercise or play a sport. Cooking, gardening, shopping, all these things that, that again, take you away from, uh, you know, these uh, situations where you're sitting around uh, with nothing else to focus on because uh, too much unstructured free time is definitely not good for uh, these situations. Over-the-counter remedies, uh, topical anesthetics. As we mentioned before, uh, cortisone, cream or ointment, uh, skin moisturizers, dry skin that becomes itchy uh, can, or flaky can also uh, encourage uh, picking. Antibiotic ointment with a bandage, you know, if you have any uh, open sores or wounds or scabs, the bandage, of course, really does prevent further picking and the antibiotic speeds healing. Skin conditioning products, you know, whatever works for you, whatever you happen to find. And also just something as simple as practicing better Hydration, just drinking enough water, can also help alleviate the dry skin conditions, particularly if you live in a dry climate. Okay, let's go on to the C part of this, or cognitive, okay? And, and the goal here is to challenge and replace distorted or extreme beliefs in order to relieve the extreme emotions, such as anger, anxiety, or depression that they cause. Uh, and the interventions that we use under cognitive therapy are cognitive therapy itself or cognitive restructuring as it's sometimes called and also learning problem-solving skills. These can also be very important. 
So question, why doesn't everyone respond to their skin picking in the same way? I have some people who are absolutely devastated by it. I have other people who say, well, I don't like it, but uh, you know, I want to get it under control, but it doesn't affect the way I interact with the world or the way I feel about myself. So you see many different responses to this. So the answer is these people think differently. This is what differs them from each other. So let's talk about this. Uh, as we know, changing your thinking can lead to changing your behavior, and changing your behavior can lead to changing your thinking. These things are reciprocal. So in, in the therapy for this, we're not trying to just change behavior. By changing our thinking, it can also lead to behavioral change. So this is why we include it. And, and you know, again, thoughts and beliefs can be very powerful inputs into these disorders. Oh, wait a second. I think I went, okay. So what does cognitive therapy do? First of all, it teaches people to learn to better listen to themselves and spot errors in their own thinking, uh, to challenge extreme or erroneous thoughts and beliefs and establish a better philosophy about life in general, and to substitute with more moderate and evidence-based thinking and use better or less extreme self-talk that helps you cope. So some important points further about cognitive therapy. It deals with problems in the here and now. It gets you to accept personal responsibility for your emotions and behavior. In other words, you realize that if you are feeling, uh, you know, problem emotions, that it's, it's the result of what you believe, what you have told yourself, not what other people have done to you, uh, is what you find out. Uh, it discourages you from blaming problems on other people or things. Uh, again, just another side of accepting personal responsibility. It encourages you to change yourself rather than other people or situations that will never change or that you don't control. Uh, and of course, the only one ultimately that we can control is us. Uh, it teaches you to accept difficulties and unpleasantness that are a normal part of life, you know, and that affect us all. And it encourages self-acceptance, unconditional self-acceptance, I should say, which is a very important concept, which could be a whole lecture in itself, really. Okay, so what kind of thoughts are important when dealing with skin picking? Well, they, they kind of break down into three categories. There are thoughts about ourselves, thoughts about treatment, and thoughts about skin and perfection. So let's, let's review some of these. Uh, some thoughts or irrational beliefs about ourselves. Uh, these are some samples. If I cannot control my behavior, I am a weak and worthless reject. These are things that I have actually heard people say, by the way. Uh, because I have damaged my own appearance, I must be defective and crazy. Uh, because I have not been able to control my behavior in the past, I will not be able to do so in the future. Now, uh, one, one uh, caveat here is that not everybody thinks all of these thoughts, but many times one or more of these may occur to a particular person and, and cause them a lot of distress. Uh, some further uh, thoughts. Because I am worthless and defective, I do not deserve to recover. As a result of my defective appearance, I will always be undesirable, and no one will ever want to be with me. Uh, if my friends or loved ones knew about my behavior, they would think I was crazy and reject me. And some further thoughts about ourselves. I hate my behavior and cannot help but get upset and depressed whenever I have to face it. Getting control over this behavior is simply too hard. I will never recover. And it's not fair that I have this. It shouldn't exist. Life should have treated me better. So these are all disturbing or self-disturbing thoughts that people uh, irrationally come up with about themselves. Uh, as I like to ask my patients, I, I say is in appearance really the true meaning of life? And of course, I try to get them to see that there's a lot more than that. Okay, thoughts about treatment. Uh, recovering from compulsive skin picking should not be hard for me. This is some demands that you know people make about treatment. Getting recovered should not take long. Some people think, oh, you know, just a week or two and I'm, I'm over it. I should get well perfectly and without slips or setbacks of any kind. If I do have them, it will prove I simply cannot recover. Not true. Again, all uh, anytime you learn a new skill, you're going to have slips or setbacks. It's, it's inevitable. I must always have everyone's support and understanding if I am to recover. Nice if you can get it, but you can't always. Uh, I cannot simply settle for recovery. I must be cured 100%. Uh, watch out for perfectionism. It's a real uh, obstacle to getting over anything because it, it leads to all or nothing thinking so that if people aren't immediately successful, they just want to give up and, and quit and go home. Okay, thoughts about skin. Even even more detail here. Uh, my skin is too 
rough, bumpy, coarse, scaly, scabby, et cetera, and must be fixed, again, leads to picking. If I fix this one spot, things will be even, smooth, perfect, et cetera. You, you fill in the blank. Uh, we know, of course, this is not uh, the end of it ever for anybody. Uh, I will just pick this one spot, and that's it. I deserve this because, you know, I've had a hard day, or I'm not feeling good, or something didn't go right for me, uh, or it's my birthday, you know, whatever. Uh, one pick won't matter, and of course, uh, every pick matters, so that, of course, is not true also. So in cognitive therapy, we look to uh, first understand how people disturb themselves, and, and uh, the way this works is an event happens, you tell yourself something extreme and illogical about it, and then you react with extreme emotions and behaviors. This is the structure of a disturbance, how, how disturbances happen. Okay, well, how do you relieve a disturbance if we know how we cause it? What do we do about it? So there's three steps here. Number one, we dispute and question each belief, seeking evidence that will either support or debunk it. We then try to find new beliefs to replace the ones that cannot be supported by the facts. And these new beliefs will most likely be much less extreme and more logical you know, than the, our original set of beliefs. And then we see if, uh, if you can predict what the consequences would be if you had used your new beliefs to begin with, to understand how they would have helped to uh, relieve and, and even prevent the disturbance from happening in the first place. Uh, we, we use what's called an ABC model of disputing and changing beliefs. So we say, again, just to recap, uh, briefly describe the activating event, how it all started. That's where the A is. I use C as a second step because it's easier to understand. We say state the emotional and behavioral consequences that followed the activating event, or A. Third step is identify the beliefs that came between A and C. In other words, what you told yourself about what happened. And then D, uh, dispute and question each belief to see it as, if it is logical or correct. Then uh, if we find that they're not logical and correct, in step five, uh, we restate, moderate, and replace those uh, of your original beliefs, which could not logically stand up to being disputed. And I'm going to show you an example in a moment of how this is done, if this seems a little uh, confusing. Okay, and then finally we predict what effect, or E, the effect of more logical and realistic thinking would be on your original consequences. So let me take you through uh, how we do uh, an example of this. Okay, number one, activating event. So the person says to themselves, I have picked my skin badly and have many scars, bleeding, and red spots. It doesn't look very good at all. So C, consequences, emotional and behavioral. I feel angry at myself and am depressed a lot of the time. I avoid dating and social contacts. I have to hide the effects of my behavior. So beliefs, what did, what did this person tell themselves? Because I have damaged my skin, it proves I am crazy, defective and, and worth, a crazy, defective and worthless person that no one will ever find attractive. So then what we do, those, those three are the, the structure of how this person disturbed themselves, which can then of course lead to more picking. And this is where cognitive therapy comes in. Uh, we dispute the idea. So number one, how does picking my skin prove that I am crazy? The answer is it doesn't. I am a normal person in all other respects and I'm not having delusions or hallucinations. My behavior may seem crazy to those who do not understand it, but that doesn't make me crazy. I can conduct other areas of my life in a rational manner. So we've disproved that first idea. Second idea, where is the evidence that it makes me defective and worthless in my entirety as a human being? And the answer is there is none. Skin picking is just one aspect of the many thousands of things that make up the totality of who I am. I am more than the appearance of the skin on my body. It does not totally define me as a person and is not my complete identity. Also, it is something I can recover from. So how can something so changeable be used to measure me? So if, you know, picking makes me defective and worthless, and let's say I recover now, you know, how can I say I'm defective and worthless anymore? It doesn't make any sense that you can measure yourself that way. Okay, and three, is there any, really any proof that no one will ever find me attractive? The answer is, while I may not look my best at the moment, there's no proof that no one will ever find me attractive. No one can predict the future and I can do my best to recover. I will do what I can for the moment to improve things cosmetically, but attractiveness is not simply external. It also has much to do with the person I am and the way I live my life. Uh, so now, we're going we're gonna to restate our, our and moderate our logical beliefs. So now what we're saying is, I really don't like the fact that I take my skin and I totally dislike the effect it has on my appearance. 
but I know that apart from this problem, I am in all other respects a normal person. It is a behavior that I do, but it is not my identity as a human being, and I can see myself beyond my symptoms. Two, even if I don't look the way I would like at present, it doesn't mean that I cannot keep working to make things better in the future. And three, I cannot completely control who does or does not find me attractive, nor can I predict that I will not improve my appearance in the future. I do not have to choose to live as a social recluse and can still spend time with friends and even date if I wish to. If someone is unable to appreciate me as a person, it is probably someone I wouldn't choose to be with anyway. So these are our new logical beliefs to replace the old illogical beliefs. And we see that if we thought this way, we would not experience the same kind of disturbed emotions that occurred from the first set of thoughts. And finally, predict the effect of new beliefs on original emotional and behavioral consequences. So instead of the old, not very good consequences, maybe our new consequences would be, one, I would not waste time feeling angry at myself, and I would stop making myself depressed over ideas that do not make any sense. I could stop letting society dictate to me how I should feel about myself, accept myself as the complex being I am, and stop reducing myself to merely one characteristic, that is, the way my skin looks. I could get out more and perhaps even date if I felt like it. Who knows, I might even just, I might just find someone who understands compulsive skin picking and appreciates me and accepts me as I am. So this is a good example of, of how, of what we teach people in cognitive therapy and how you use it as a tool. Oop, wait a second. Sorry about that. Just uh, skip. Okay. Okay, I had mentioned also basic problem solving skills. Because being able to solve problems reduces, also reduces stress and overstimulation. So th this is just basic problem solving you can look up anywhere. And, and the steps are, instead of getting upset or depressed about a problem, we identify the problem. We make a list of as many possible alternative solutions as you can think of, even bad ones. Pick the solution likeliest to work. Try to implement the solution. Put it into action evaluate how well it worked, and if it didn't work, select a new alternative and repeat steps four through six. And this is how you solve problems in a nutshell, very simply. It doesn't, some people make it a lot more complicated than this, but it really isn't. You can, you can work your way through any problem situation if you just stick to this and, and skip the part where you get upset about the fact that you have a problem. Okay, so let's keep moving along. Okay, so as I like to tell people, getting recovered is not just about getting clear skin back. Again, it's all about changing the way you think, changing your behavior. There's, there's many, many things that go into a uh, recovery. Okay, A in SCAM, affective, emotional inputs to help you calm yourself or manage discomfort. And what are the interventions for uh, the emotional inputs? Uh, emotion regulation, short term and long term, and medications such as uh, SSRIs, for instance, for, uh, you know, like emotional uh, dysregulation problems like depression or, or severe anxiety. Okay, basic emotions we know include things like shame, uh, concern or fear, those are sort of two ends of a spectrum, anger or frustration, again two ends of a, of a, of a spectrum, joy or happiness, sadness uh, or at the other end depression, and disgust or interest. So, emotional regulation, what does it do? Uh, we try to reduce the production of negative and extreme emotions, decrease vulnerability to negative and extreme emotions, not avoiding things that make you anxious, which of course can only make you more anxious in the long run, and increasing positive emotions. So what do we mean by that? Uh, emotional regulation, again, we're talking about reducing the production of negative and extreme emotions and increasing positive emotions. So first of all, uh, we use cognitive therapy, which we just reviewed. Again, there's some overlap here. To help establish a healthy and logical set of beliefs and therefore better coping skills. You know, having a good philosophy is really a key to uh, living a, a balanced life, which is the next step. Uh, and a balanced lifestyle overall, in, in addition to thinking straight, involves like a healthy diet, sufficient sleep, sufficient exercise, productive and satisfying work, a healthy social life and relationships, avoidance of illegal drugs and excessive use of alcohol. And finally, uh, increasing levels of positive and pleasurable experiences, long-term and short-term. So these, these are all ways that you can, again, maximize more positive emotions and decrease negative emotions. Uh, 
how you would do this would you know depend on each individual and what their preferences are and what fits their particular lifestyle. But balance is the key to health in everyone, uh, and I think we would all agree on that. Okay, M or motor or motoric for blocking, delaying, or substituting, uh, you know, for the behaviors. Uh, the interventions are awareness training, get you to focus on the behavior, and for that we do self-monitoring, like you saw those sheets in the beginning, or learning mindfulness, uh, response prevention, which is strategies to block the behavior, and then competing response training, which finds substitutes for the behavior, things you can't do and do the behavior at the same time, which would include like self-manicure, skin care, and exercise, or motor exercises that are incompatible with picking. Is a little cartoon I found. I always like this. The for the, if it's that clear on your screen, I hope it is. The, the dog is wearing one of those collars that vets put on them and says, "You know, you might want to try one of these things yourself." It certainly helped my obsessive grooming problems. You don't see too many cartoons on this uh, on this topic. Anyway, back to our uh, our list here. Okay, so blocking strategies again for you know on the motoric end of things. Uh, throw out all picking implements. Not easy for some people to do but you really do have to get rid of them if, if you use implements. Cutting your fingernails very short, uh, applying acrylic nail tips, but this only works for some people. Some people actually can encourage picking, so we don't use that for everyone. Uh, switch grooming activities to times when you're less tired and stressed. Let a professional perform certain grooming activities. Avoid physical postures associated with behavior problems, you know, that might put your hand, for instance, in contact with an area that you tend to pick. Uh, cover mirrors with layers of plastic wrap. This is something I, I've always done with people. Two or three layers is enough to make things obscure enough so that you really can't use a mirror. Mirrors figure into some people's picking, not everybody's, but some. Uh, more blocking strategies. Get rid of magnifying mirrors. Those are very bad things uh, for skin picking or hair pulling. Wearing dark or tinted lenses when in the, the bathroom or around mirrors. Uh, refrain from wearing eyeglasses or contacts when performing grooming activities that went around mirrors so you can't you know, see that clearly to see things that might stimulate picking some of just the sight of uh, particular places on the body can, can get picking going. Uh, use a compact mirror when putting on makeup. And another one is wear white cotton dermatological gloves or socks in bed or when in other high risk areas. Uh, I like the gloves a lot. They're lightweight, uh, they breathe, uh, they're cheap, and they really do act as reminders or, or blockers basically for picking. Uh, other strategies would involve wearing driving gloves in the car if you pick when you're in the car. For some people, that's become connected with the behaviors. Uh, don't linger in bed after awakening. Some people just lying there with nothing to do will engage in their behaviors. Putting band-aids or tape strips over your fingertips uh, or on scabs. Avoid wearing shorts or short sleeve shirts in high-risk places. Uh, wear clothing that covers target areas. In other words, like things with sleeves or, or le longer legs. Uh, install dimmer switches in rooms where picking is likely to happen. Again, can be a big help. Competing response training. Uh, play an active video game that requires both hands. Again, these are things you, you can't do and do your picking at the same time generally, although if it turns out you can, then might not be the best strategy uh, for you, any particular one. Uh, play a musical instrument. In fact, I just have a, a patient who took up piano to help uh, not pick. Uh, squeeze a foam ball, stress ball, or soft toy. Uh, find small toys and items to manipulate. These sort of overlap again with our uh, the things that, that uh, soothe or, or uh, uh, can even supply stimulation. Uh, clench your fists and grip, the, grip an object tightly. Sometimes uh, doing this for, say, so about a minute or so uh, can help uh, to, for an urge, to get an urge to pass, and you can keep repeating it as necessary. Uh, gripping the arms of a chair. Uh, giving yourself a manicure, again, with precautions, because that can be risky for some people. Uh, exercise, like using a hand exercise, or just uh, any kind of an exercise regimen in general. Okay, lastly is P, or place, environment, because environments in particular places become connected with these behaviors. So it involves modifying the physical or social environment. So interventions would include stimulus control, which means modify or remove triggers in the environment or what's called contingency management, uh, rewards or penalties. I think that's that's pretty self-explanatory, rewarding yourself for good behavior or, or penalizing yourself for undesirable behavior. Although I tend to lean toward rewards, I think it works better, but some people 
like penalties too. Okay, stimulus control. It's a behavioral treatment that seeks to help identify and then eliminate, avoid, or change the activities, environmental factors, states, or circumstances that trigger undesirable behaviors. And these trigger the behaviors because, uh, you know, the, these uh, things that we've just listed can become connected with picking and can get you to start doing it when they get activated. Uh, the goal is to consciously control these triggers that lead to the behaviors and create new learned connections between the urges and new non-destructive behaviors. That is to replace the learned connections between uh, urges and destructive behaviors. So some things that you can do to modify your env environment. Some of these we've mentioned already, which is, you know, again, standing uh, further away from covering uh, wrapping or soaping mirrors using a compact mirror for hair and makeup that you have to hold with one hand so it only allows you one hand to apply makeup for instance rearranging your furniture that can actually have an effect in some cases sit in new and different places during trigger activities like some people pick when they watch TV so we say sit in it sometimes sitting in a different chair can make a difference because the behavior is not connected with that uh, particular piece of furniture uh, turn out lights or use dimmers in target locations as we mentioned, wearing dark glasses in high-risk locations. Don't go to bed until you're ready to sleep. You know, lying there or doing other activities like playing with your phone or being on your computer can lead to uh, these behaviors. Uh, talk on the phone in low-risk areas. Again, talking on the phone is a big one for many people. Uh, leave the house. Sometimes just getting out of the house if the urges are strong uh, can help. Uh, break up daily routines that often lead to problem behaviors. This is why we we have people fill out those sheets. We can identify all these things, and then uh, we give them particular interventions. Usually, we try to do things for a space of about a week. Uh, if after a week it still isn't working uh, or it doesn't have any effect at all, we'll switch to something else. But it's always good to try something for at least about a week to give it a, a fair chance. Okay, uh, avoid combining high-risk activities. So if you pick in, in when you're in bed and when you're talking on the phone, obviously talking on the phone in bed is going to be even worse. Uh, minimize time spent in high-risk areas, you know, bathroom and bedroom are two big areas for some people. Spend less time alone. Often the presence of other people can be a deterrent. Do reading, writing, or computing in public locations such as libraries or coffee shops. My student patients, uh, public school or college students uh, often uh, when they're studying that can be kind of uh, stressful or overstimulating or even boring sometimes and that can lead to picking. So we try to change that around. Uh, switch reading, TV, or computing to locations, again, not associated with problem behavior. So you're beginning, I'm sure, to see a pattern to all these things. And that pretty much covers uh, what I wanted to go over. Um, for those people who want to email me at any time in the future, I, I do my best to uh, get back to you. This is my, my email address, penzel85 at yahoo.com. Uh, I will do the best I can to answer your question and get back to you. And then uh, finally, uh, just again, I, I think uh, TLC uh, Foundation for BFRBs is a uh, an organization very worthy of your support. It's the only organization that really cares about people with these disorders and does anything for them and is sponsoring any real research for them, looking for you know proper treatments and and uh, trying to find out what really is behind these problems. And as it says, sharing knowledge, supporting recovery, finding a cure. There's a great national conference every year. We just had a wonderful one in San Francisco. Next year's will be in Washington, D.C. And, no, uh, no. <laughs> Coming up in San Francisco. I'm sorry. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was in St. Louis this year. Forgive me. Yeah, I'm getting them confused with other conferences now. Uh, yeah, San, uh, San Francisco is next year. Yeah, last last year, this last year's one uh, was in St. Louis. So they'll, they, they get spread around the country so everybody gets a chance uh, hopefully to find one that's uh, in their vicinity. And finally, uh, you know, supporting recovery and finding a cure. That's what we all want more than anything else. So, okay, uh, I'm ready to answer any questions. I hope I covered this uh, thoroughly enough. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. That was wonderful and, and definitely very thorough. Um, for anyone who wasn't on at the beginning, I'm Jen Rakes. I'm the executive director of TLC. Thank you for joining us. And I apologize, um, Fred doesn't even know this, but apparently we had some, some pretty serious uh, logging on problems at the beginning of the webinar. Um, so I apologize for that. I don't actually quite know what the, the problem was yet, but we'll look into it. And uh, so if you missed the intro, um, 
This is an opportunity to ask Fred questions. The way that you can do that, since we can't hear you, is to type them in. So on your control panel towards the bottom, there's a tab that says questions. If you click the arrow so that that tab opens, um, you can type in your question there, and I will um, then field your questions to Fred for the next few minutes. And this whole webinar was recorded. Um, I don't anticipate any problem with that. Um, so we will email you uh, with the link so that you can watch the entire um, webinar in case you missed uh, any portion of it. Um, and then you can watch it again and again if you, <laughs> if you need a booster. Um, so um, please do uh, type in any questions you might have and I will, I will start us off with one that's always really important to me um, as, a, as a puller and a, an occasional picker. Um, and that is to, to get at the issue of motivation a little bit, Fred. Um, yeah. and, and as I know you're aware, our, our fluctuating <laughs> relationship with motivation uh, to stop picking or pulling. Um, how do you address that as a therapist when someone comes in to, you know, wanting help, but but perhaps um, struggling with, you know, in the moment that we are pulling or picking, maybe not always wanting to stop. Well, and, and that's true. You know, and a lot of people, we've asked them in the past, you know, if you could do these behaviors and everything would automatically heal itself right away, uh, would you keep doing it? And people say, sure, you know, I, I would be happy to keep doing it if there were no consequences. But, of course, there are. And, and pro problems with motivation I think can be the result of, of a number of different things. One, of course, is, is we talk about cognitive inputs, like just believing that uh, it's stronger than I am, I'm too weak, I can't do it. So we, we, we use cognitive therapy, of course, to help dispute these ideas and show people that it may be hard, but it's not too hard. And if they tell them themselves it's too hard, all they're doing is, is sapping their motivation. They're keeping themselves from doing what they really might be capable of doing. So that's, that's one input. Another, of course, is just that you know, we, we often point out to people that, uh, you know, your expectations are a, an important point, too. Those ideas that I have to get better immediately, or it should be easy, or it shouldn't take time, or I shouldn't have slip-ups. So we, we try to deal with people's, you know, perfectionism or unrealistic expectations and say, no, you know, oh, changing any habit, we don't care what it is, or learning any new skill is hard work. It takes time. You're going to have slip-ups. I mean, I, I, like I tell people, if you wanted to learn to play uh, – championship tennis, you wouldn't go out on the court the first day and expect to, uh, you know, enter the U.S. Open or something. So, you know, you have to be realistic in, in how these are. And also, I think, you know, you have to be persistent. You have to be the kind of person who has their goal in mind and wants it so badly that they refuse to let anything become an obstacle. And to see that obstacles are a normal part of this and do come up. And you can expect them. I, I've never seen anyone get well perfectly. I've seen a lot of people have slips. But I've also seen people get right back on track and get back to it and accept, okay, I'm not perfect, recovery isn't perfect, but if I keep at it, I know that I can continue to do better. So I, I hope that sort of answers your, your question. That definitely helps. Thank you. Um, let me field a couple from our other, our other attendees. Sure. Um, uh, hello, I have a client who has a strong aversion to gloves and socks, however, is desperately looking for other interventions for interfering with her picking. She's using Band-Aids, but struggling with those. Any, any other barrier type suggestions? Well, if we're talking about barriers strictly, um, hmm. uh, I'm assuming this person is having problems because of maybe like sensory issues or things like that. I mean, like the, the cotton dermatological gloves are usually good for people who don't love gloves because they're very lightweight and they breathe. Sometimes even if we can just get people to use them in bed just for sleeping overnight, that can be a help. Um, but there's, there's, you know, there's all kinds of little barriers. There's these little uh, plastic and rubber finger covers that people use or finger cots that some people use. Sometimes I, as I often point out to people because, you know, usually picking takes place with just one or two fingers. Sometimes just covering one or two fingers with a, a tape strip or a Band-Aid is enough. You don't have to do every finger. Sometimes, you know, just doing a modified version of that uh, can be good. Or, you know, if, if none of the barrier things work, then, again, finding uh, useful things to manipulate or that are stimulating to the hands uh, are very good. The, those little uh, star washers that I was talking about or what are called tooth lock washers, uh, those are extremely helpful. You tie them together, put them on a, you string them together in a, in a bunch, they form a little cylinder, and then you squeeze them and they're extremely stimulating. So sometimes if the barrier 
approach won't work, then finding alternative effective means of stimulation will work. And, and there's also some very good websites where you can find uh, helps. One is called uh, therapyshop.com with two Ps, and the other is called um, abilitations with an A, abilitations.com. These are occupational therapy sites and have all kinds of really wonderful things that you can uh, not find anywhere else and that are very useful and that are used for treating like sensory issues in, in occupational therapy or in people with autism. Uh, so so I, I recommend looking there. Sometimes you just have to be extremely creative. That's, uh, there's no one thing that works for everybody. Again, uh, I, I had uh, actually gave a, a list a while back to uh, TLC that I think they have on their website, uh, Jen. I think, is, is that not correct? Yeah, it's like a list just, of all, that's right. I was just going to add that, it, yeah, it, it, that, that we have a um, list both from Fred and, and other people. So uh, in addition to being able to access all of our former webinars, ones that you may have missed, there are also a lot of articles and, and fun lists like that, like the big giant list of fiddles and, and, and you know, things like that that can help you um, just to, you know, keep those fingers busy <laughs> in, yeah, a, in a positive way. Um, and uh, and one that I've liked recently, I'll just add, is it might not help if the person doesn't like gloves, but they're these knitted little thumb slings, basically. You can find them on Etsy, and they have little beads knitted right into them so that it sort of has a little sling around your hand, and, and then you can fiddle. It covers your thumb, which is the key to pulling or picking. And uh, so anyway, there's lots of creative stuff like that. So becoming part of this community and, uh, you know, joining our Facebook group or um, and other online communities, then you can kind of um, brainstorm with other people. They may have had creative ideas. Um, okay, so next question. Uh, yeah. um, do you have any resources, diagrams, or images on what is healthy to pick and not to pick? Um, I'm a little uncertain about the meaning of that question. I mean, if we're talking about just normal, everyday little grooming activities, um, you know, I mean, then I guess that would be okay to pick. I don't, I don't know if I've ever seen a definitive list of those things. Uh, nobody's ever really asked me that question before. It's a good question. Um, I would say any, I, I could sort of answer that in a reverse kind of way and just say that anything that causes any kind of skin damage or destruction should definitely not be on the list of things that are okay to pick. Uh, that that would be my main thing. You know, I, I would say that's that's sort of the cutting line. Uh, if it's non-destructive, if it doesn't cause uh, you know damage, scarring, bleeding, scabbing, uh, bruising, anything like that, then I guess you would want to uh, say you know it would be okay. But beware of anything that does cause those things. That's that's I, I don't know. I'm not quite sure else how else to answer that one. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like with picking, with, with hair pulling, there are, you know, levels of grooming one's eyebrows or stray hairs that, right. that, that we all kind of consider normal and, and reasonably healthy. Um, and with picking, there's probably degrees of that that, we, that most people do to some extent. Um, I remember a, a dermatologist that served on our scientific advisory board once sort of saying that when he had patients with acne, he didn't even really bother to tell them not to pick it, even though one should not pick it. We, we all convince ourselves that picking the pimple is going to make it go away or, or help it. It doesn't really help it. But, um, but he just knew that, you know, people were more likely than not to wind up picking it, that kind of thing. Um, and where it becomes a real problem is, you know, when we keep picking in it and can't stop, but um, but any picking at all, of course, opens you up to the possibility of um, infections. Yeah. Also, I think if if you already have a skin picking problem, sometimes as I as I mentioned in some of my lists earlier, it's sometimes better to let a professional do your grooming activities, like get a manicure instead of trying to you know bite or pick your cuticles and make them look better or things like that, because some of these things are just risky activities and can just lead to uh, not being able to stop, you know, so you'll get on a roll and uh, it just sort of takes on a life of its own. So we have to be very careful about things like that. Uh, but, you know, as in with hair pulling, you know, pulling the, the stray hair out with a tweezer now and then, you know, obviously that's not going to be a problem. Pulling hairs, let's say, to the point where you have bald spots, that clearly is not uh, a good thing to be doing at all. So, 
So, you know, little, I mean, everybody does, all human beings do little bits of picking, pulling, biting at themselves. You just look around yourself, you'll see it. It's just that in these cases, it's really things that have gone beyond that and, and have led, you know, become sort of destructive or, or damaging in some way. So if you think you have any tendencies toward that, better to minimize those kind of behaviors in general and, and uh, you know, put some distance between yourself and them and, and getting someone else to help with, uh, you know, like a cosmetologist or something is probably a better strategy overall. That's right. Put yourself in, you know, go for a professional to, to help with your grooming so that you're not tempted. Um, getting back to the question I asked about motivation, um, this is one that comes up, and I know you've dealt with it because <laughs> yeah. we've, we've discussed it in the past. Um, how do you help, especially parents whose children or maybe even adult, you know, children, really don't want to stop or are really struggling with motivation so that, that you know a loved one may really see that this is an issue and that, that help is needed but but the person who's affected is really struggling just doesn't seem to want to stop what can we do well uh, the, the fact of the matter and in fact it's funny that you should mention this because it just came up last night I have a boy who does this and he just hasn't really been doing his homework very much he's a 13 year old boy and he doesn't really care that much about his appearance. And his mother was, you know, catching him doing it and watching him and, and trying to almost do his homework for him. And I told her, I said, no, you know, this can't work. Everybody has to control it themselves. They said, there's only one person who controls this, and this is your son. You don't control it. And if he isn't ready to do it yet, there's no, you know, force that can, that can make him be ready. Sometimes uh, children have to get to a certain point in the development where they develop like a social uh, you know, social sense where they, they decide that they want to look better, you know, for social reasons and don't want to stand out or attract unwanted attention, and then they become motivated to do it. Sometimes, you know, you're just dealing with someone who's either not mature enough or just not ready yet to, to do these things. So what, what I always believe in, instead of making them, you know, upset about it or making them feel bad or guilty or that they're bad people or, or punishing them or anything like that, I just let them know that help is available. Uh, you know, you do what things you can, I mean, in terms of, you know, if there's any wounds or, you know, bandaging them or, or taking care of them or things like that. And, and uh, you know, just letting them know that, hope, that help is available whenever they're ready to do it. But they, they've got to come to you and, and tell you, the parent, about it. Because you can't, you can't make people want to get better more than they do. So, so it's really up to them because ultimately each, it's up to each person to control their own behavior. And, and it's not, you know, it's, it's, I hate having to tell parents these things, but it's the truth. You know, I mean, I, I can't show them a magic way to make their, their child motivated if the motivation just isn't there. Sometimes, I mean, in, in children we can create like reward systems uh, but, you know, that are reasonable where they can earn uh, desirable things, what we call contingency management. Uh, you know, by doing the behaviors or taking part in therapy, sometimes that'll work. Not always. Sometimes a uh, kid doesn't even want to be bothered with that. Some, some kids will right, buy into it and they'll do very well. Other kids, uh, nothing's going to make them do it right now. And the more you try to push them, the more resistant they become. And when you see that, you just have to back off, basically. So, so uh, you know, again, it depends on the child. It depends on where they are at at that particular time. But, but don't think you can make somebody or force somebody uh, to get better, it always ends badly, I, I would say. And it, it just leaves the person with a bad feeling about therapy and treatment. And, and it sometimes puts the whole topic out of reach. Like they don't even want to talk about it anymore. So then you really don't have any access at all. So, you, you know, you just intervene around the edges where you can to contain things and hope that, you know, eventually they'll they'll come around. And that's, that's I think, is about the best you can do. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add for older, from my own experience, is that um, information about um, about treatment and the fact that it, you know, having some contact with people for that that have been helped could be useful, because certainly most of us have tried to stop over and over again and failed, or, or uh, you know, this might not be as relevant for kids, but many of us as adults have even tried various therapies and they haven't worked. Um, they may not. Yeah. Many cases they weren't good therapy, but we didn't necessarily know that. Um, and uh, so you can also feel a lot of dis, you know, hopelessness about it actually working. And, and then why do why am I going to try if it doesn't really feel internally like it's likely to work? 
Um, or just it just might feel so hard to stop that you kind of don't want to have to try because it feels so difficult. Well, one thing I can, I can add also is that sometimes bringing kids to TLC conferences or retreats can be very helpful because some, some kids show up initially, you know, saying, oh, I don't want to be here. I don't want any part of this. But then they, they meet some other, you know, kids their own age and they start talking to them and uh, they suddenly realize, hey, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one. And uh, they see some kids who've been successful or they hear some good uh, feedback about treatment from some of these kids and they become interested. So uh, peer uh, exposure can be a, a really good thing. I think Jen, you know, mentioned that. But th this is one place where you really you can bring your, your child where they really will come into contact with uh, many other kids. Kids often you know come away from there uh, making long term friendships and and it leads them into treatment and you know other kids can be encouraging and positive and they hear success stories. So uh, yeah, that that is another another thing that you actually can do. That some sometimes I can't say every time, but an awful lot of the time I've seen kids come in one state of mind and leave in, in a completely different one altogether and much more positive and motivated. Okay. We have a couple of more um, really good questions. Yeah. Uh, what recommendations do you have for kids who need strategies at school but want to be discreet? Uh, again, you know, we find small, you know, in uh, sort of non-distinguishable things that they can use, things that are hand-sized, things they can put in their pockets. Uh, things that they can put inside their desks. Uh, and of course, at the same time, we try to educate teachers, if we can too, so that they don't call undue attention to these things, because the teacher can be a big help. Sitting at the back of the room, so that you don't have you know 20 people sitting behind you uh, observing everything you do, uh, can be a help. And uh, write, sometimes I have to write letters to the school to get permission for children to bring certain toys and things with them to class to handle. Uh, but schools are usually pretty cooperative for the most part. I've never been refused on that. But you know, you just keep things small and manageable and, and you know, discreet essentially and, and, and never had huge problems with that actually. Okay. Um, what is the best way to approach a person who's in the process of a picking session that will avoid a fight or, or a worsening of the emotional distress that may already be in progress? Well, you know, again, we, we have to understand that only the person themselves can stop you know and and you know sometimes people think well I'll just tell them to stop and they'll stop but they, but they want to stop they just you know sort of can't at the same time as much as they would like to it's it can be very maddening uh, you know feeling both of those uh, emotions you know like wanting to do it but wanting to stop at the same time it's a very conflicting um, you know I don't know if, if it really you know talking to people while they're in the middle to try to get them to stop is sort of again believing that you can control it and I think that they have to want to stop themselves and they have to use tools that are given to them. Uh, making people self-conscious or constantly, you know, trying to get their attention or, you know, uh, calling out to them or snapping your fingers or tapping them on the shoulder or, you know, making comments or things like that generally bring about a lot of negative effects and getting a person stressed or overstimulated, again, can only lead to more uh, picking, actually. So it might actually bring about the reverse. I think if you're going to talk to somebody at all, it's probably better to talk to them at a time uh, when it's not happening. And and I think that that you know, you might have more chance of success rather than doing something that could potentially embarrass them or upset them and all. And and uh, you know if you want to talk about say hey you know if you thought about getting treatment or maybe there's help for this, doing it at a time as I say when they're not engrossed and it might be might be a better timing. Yeah, yeah. I I think. Um... The, the question, the follow-up question I would have as a parent myself of, yeah. of, of a child who's doing some of the, some picking um, is, is the, the awareness and is there a role for a parent to play in the sense of somebody being lost in thought, like are they even self-aware at that moment that they're doing it and isn't there a role to play in bringing self-awareness? Yeah. Actually, some of the, the strategies that we had talked about can actually lead to awareness, you know, like some of the blocking things or, or making substitute things available. When you deal with very small children, again, yeah, I mean, I guess you can sort of help uh, with, their, with their consent, of course, you know, remind them when they're doing it or try to help them or kids who have problems with uh, focus or concentrations, you know, like ADD and things like that. Uh, sometimes you can be of help, but it, I think that should be coordinated with 
you know, a therapist or as part of the, the treatment package and, and try to work that in and get the person on board with that, you know, the child so that they're, they're okay with that. They don't feel like they're being nagged or, or picked on or anything because how you do it is just as important, I think. Yeah, so, so come up with a strategy with the child ahead of time. Like, do you want me to do, if I yes. notice that you're picking or pulling, do you want me to say anything? Do you want me to do, if so, what? What could I say that would be useful to you? And let them exactly. have a exactly. voice in yes. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because so much of it is tone. Like, my mom, we didn't have therapy back then or even a name for these disorders, but yeah. um, but I remember her very gently saying, you know, pick, pick, if she would notice, if, she, if I seemed to be tranced out and doing it. And yeah. I didn't like that as much because it was a gentle tone. It wasn't a sort of nagging tone. Yeah, like, hey, cut it out or stop yeah, that. Exactly. Or, stop it. You know, uh, that, that that's kind of annoying. <laughs> Not, not gonna get it, it could have been annoying if I didn't if I was embarrassed and really didn't want her drawing attention to it. So exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. you got to be uh, uh, diplomatic about it, and you've got to be uh, em empathetic, you know, toward the person. Yeah, and it is. I'll just say because I'm experiencing it personally, it is really hard as a parent to watch your children do these behaviors and not stop. It's it's incredibly hard because you want to be able to. To help them, and you, 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 you know, you feel it almost physically. So, getting Absolutely. yourself the help that, you know, getting yourself a peer network of other parents that you can talk to, um, people in our community um, are constantly reaching out to each other for support because it's really difficult. And it's, we, I know, I, I've, I've had more than 20 years with TLC to learn all these lessons, and I still get it wrong probably numerous times a day. So I really, you know, I really recommend that parents nurture themselves and reach out for help because it's, you know, it's very um, upsetting, uh, you know, to not be able to help your child. There's also a good, a good book actually called A Parent Guide to Hair Pulling Disorder. Right. That, that is worth looking at. It's a paperback written by uh, Suzanne Mouton Odom and uh, Ruth uh, Gollum. Uh, it's a great resource. So I would um, definitely recommend that too. Yes, thank you, Fred. So we are. Um, let me just see. I think yeah, we are at uh, at the end of our time. Um, but thank you so much, Fred. For, you know, you've you've given honestly, truly countless hours of your time over the years to uh, our organization and to our community, um, and obviously to all your parent patients. And we're so grateful. My pleasure. Thanks. And so visit BFRB.org if you want to find some of the additional resources that are available. Thank you all for attending. Again, I apologize for any technical frustrations that you encountered. And we will send out a link to the uh, video, uh, to the uh, recorded uh, version of this talk. And I hope that you'll stay tuned for uh, future uh, webinars in our series. Thank you all.